see of course as usual kind of feel free to you know interrupt or stick anything in chat so um looking at screening many models um this is our last so this is where the book ends currently as in i think these are all blank um so this is we need to kind of think about what's next i know there's been some discussion in the slack um i found this chapter so i think kind of a few things straight straight out the gate i think i found it really interesting and it's kind of an interesting point that it's so far down the, la the list um as in could it be introduced earlier and it kind of depends on depends on your view i guess um and yeah it's just it seems seems just really really powerful and i think i yeah there are some bits i don't understand as well um or kind of i understand the theory of what's going on but i think in practice it'll be you know it'd be good to actually get using it um so yeah screening many models i kind of think of this as like it's almost like exploratory data analysis but exploratory like model analysis like trying out a load of models all at once um before picking your model that's you're going to use on your problem um it is kind of yeah just kind of throw everything at it um and see, see if there's anything obvious um and the first thing uh so so in fact when when looking at this um or well well no when looking around the um tidy tidyverse site anyway it's interesting this um post from julia that basically choose choose your own tidy model adventure basically like choose where you want to start and she just three things um and the third one is like why not start with workflow sets which is what we're talking about so screening very models so it's almost like this is you know this is a fine place to start thinking about tidy models as well if you know what you're doing um so it's like choose your own tidy models adventure why not start with this depending on your situation um and also it's interesting uh, there's a a bit in there where it's that we don't expect that most people using tidy models will use workflow sets as it's a specialized tool only for some context um and then the other thing that i found that was really interesting but <laughs> i found less than an hour ago um so i haven't actually watched it but i usually really i i get a lot of value from this oh, there's you've got a nice little cheer advert but um the max talking about workflow sets um which is pretty cool so so and um, you know I, I find that I learned quite well from um, watching watching kind of other people talk about it as opposed to necessarily reading through the books. Um, all right, so the, uh, the examples are so I haven't I haven't done anything new myself. I'm gonna I guess kind of ping through the two examples. So just kind of a shout out to Tony and Cohort One as well that did um, a separate example that I've got up here, looking at world happiness report as opposed to concrete data um going through sections um so first off um there's so this is this is looking kind of explaining explaining the um concrete data set they do some cleaning and um standard uh train test split stuff um and defining the the cross validation that they're going to do and then uh, this yeah so it's interesting the um the two different recipes used depending on which because obviously different models that you're going to fit different types of models um have different pre-processing step pre-processing steps that are required um i was part of i was looking around the tidy model site i didn't find anything i think we must have covered it before and maybe i've forgotten but kind of knowing knowing recipes for example um knowing recipes for a specific like model type, as in giving an example, you, you should probably you should probably normalize all your predictors first if you're using this kind of model um, for each model. But I didn't see that anywhere. This this is really cool. So I, <laughs> first time I read this, um, it's, I was like looking at this code and I was like, I have no idea. Like looking through what's each specification going on. And even though they said it, you know, I'm like a, like a fool, I started looking at the code and getting overwhelmed thinking, I have no idea how to do the specification. But the parsing about it, it basically solves it for you. So in um, our studio, if you've got Parsnip installed, um, it's, there's this cool little um, little app, depending on what you're doing. So you say, okay, we're doing a regression example here, and you can search the regex as well. But basically, you pick pick your different models that you might be interested in. Oh, I want to do an arena. I want to do near snow. I don't know. Pick a few of them, um, profit, and then 
if you click that button, oh, nothing happens. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, do I need to click down? I don't think so. I think that was supposed to work. Um, let's give it another try. Maybe I need maybe I need a new a blank script ready, I think, potentially. Right, take two. Add-ins. Pass it model spec. And let's pick a few. I know this is different. There we go. Look, isn't that one? <laughs> um, so it, it does that for us. It, it gives you kind of default um, this specification for each one. Um, so I don't know about you guys. I thought that was pretty nice. I was like, oh, cool. Um, and then, so that's that bit. So you don't obviously don't need to know all of these or write them out each time. Um, they're already they're already there as part of this. Um, and so they, they, they choose a load of them, um, and they also add some hidden units. Is that all I had for um, 5.1? Yeah, that, I guess that kind of, yeah, the bit that I was a little confused on is how exactly knowing which um, yeah, which which recipe step you were going to use for each of the models, so they, they have two different recipes. Um, and then, oh, another cool thing that I, th I think we might have already mentioned in um, in this. I guess I want to stop that. We might have already mentioned in. Um, I think it's skim. Yeah. So using skim on the data set. I think is it called the yeah. app. Um, so this is this is the example. Um, Tony is from cohort one. But they're using the skim to just like as an exploratory data analysis on your data set using the skim function is. It's really cool just for getting an overview of what you've got, you know, this many rows, this many columns, and then things about the different variable types. Um, so there are loads of numeric columns in this data, kind of just gives you a, just being able to eyeball it is quite cool. Ideally, that would be on the same line. But, um, yeah, so there's that kind of slightly, slightly off topic. Um, and then we get into the actual workflow set itself, which is the, the main part of chapter 15. Um, using this, so we, we've given it the recipes that we've got and then the different models. Um, and it, as, as with everything in tidy models, it, it gives you a tibble um, that is, you know, it's a workflow set slash tibble. Here they've done it because they've got four models in this, in their list, in this models list, and then one pre-processing step. So it does, it does four. If there were two pre-processing and four models, you'd do eight, um, works like that. And then the different um, the different columns we've got here. So the workflow ID is that it's basically auto-generated and you can change it if you want. Um, there's information about the, the model that's going on. Um, the option uh, is used later about kind of anything when when you're actually eva evaluating the workflow, um, any options that are needed in there. So different models might be different things. And then the result, I'm storing the output once you get to that point. Um, and in, so in the workflow sets package, obviously tidy models, you can, there's a function pull workflow that takes, pulls the workflow out of this tibble, um, which, which makes sense. Um, and yeah, so here they using, using the options, using the option column um, to, to give parameters specific to um, specific models that they're running. And basically they're, the example here is we're throwing different types of models at this um, concrete um, data set um, with our predictor out and we can and just seeing which one to then use as in which model looks to be working best and um, if you don't have an idea ahead of that. Uh, can I say something real quick? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, option, add, option add step yeah. up there, right there. So param right there is not short for parameters. If you use parameters, it won't work. I made that mistake. It's short <laughs> for param underscore info. So it's basically like passing in, you can pass in variables to the other arguments that are gonna go into workflow or tuning grids or whatever whatever form of tuning that you're using. So that's where you, with option add, you can pass in variables to the other uh, arguments to whatever tuning thing you're using. So it's mm. param info and not parameters. Right, <laughs> right. 
information for the parameters as opposed to specifically the parameters themselves. Yeah, that's that sounds like that must have been fun debugging what was going on there. Yeah, and you can't really tell that it's not using the parameters that mm. you give it until you like look at the actual results and see what parameters it use, uses. So just like yeah, be sure you use either param or param underscore info there to give it parameters to tune. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. Sounds very valid. It, it, it gets a bit meta, doesn't it? I guess this part is that we're we're kind of zoom, we're getting levels levels away from the actual fitting one model because obviously we've got the the fact that we're doing multiple models, but then also yeah the different parameters and whatever you know tuning whatever method we're going to use for that it um it does kind of mess with the head a little bit um, I think. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, so no, that's really, that's really valid. And then I think that's it for 15.2. And I don't think there was um, anything else in this workflow service. Um, oh, so yeah, something, something interesting uh, that, that Tony did in, in this is that he, so it's a cool way of specifying the actual, the predictor. So ladder score in, in the example that, that they've used, and then they've made it symbolic so that then whenever they're, whenever they're calling it, they're doing, you know, cross validation here using bang bang to call the symbolic variable. So that then if, if later on the predictor changes and actually we want to estimate something else, you just change that down, which I had not seen before, but it's, it's a cool, cool idea. Um, I think, I think that's it. Sorry. No potentially not the most interesting thing to see me um, randomly scrolling through code. So that was that was 15.2, so actually creating this workflow set object that is this thing. Um, and then this is the actual bit, 15.3, actually doing the tuning in and evaluating. Um, so every, every model that you've got in your workflow set gets tuned in the same way. Um, and you kind of choose that, um, as you're just saying, yeah, I guess kind of chapter 13, 14, grid search, intrusive search, um, choose how we do that, how, you know, the size of our grid, um, and all that stuff. Um, and we, yeah, using workflow map, um, there. And this is, this is part, part of that method. So this is the model getting fitted so that in this example, they end up with, when you think about the fact that they each they have on the same data set, so on the training data set, they've got each parameter being tuned for each model. Um, they end up actually fitting like 25,000 models in total, all that goes, you know, all of the information which goes in the, inside this workflow set, um, the kind of output that they've, they've called grid results. Um, so it's all, all nested in there. And then, so what, once that's been run and it takes, takes quite a while, I think it's fair to say, um, depending. And there's a bit actually about how, you know, if, you, if, if time is important and you want to um, speed things up, uh, you can then use uh, rank results. So we, we spoke about um, judging model effectiveness before. Um, so looking at like which, which metric to use. So they use um, RMSE, rank results, orders, orders adds a rank column and um, Kind of spits them out and says, "Well, against which metric, this is this is how well they did," um, and then auto plot. So this is all the different models. How did they do um, when when we ran them? You go down to here. Um, one thing that I'm not fully clear on is the difference. So they've actually got the two different pre-processes, recipe and workflow variable. So you see that there's a, a circle and um, triangle inside. Um, I think I need to look further in that and probably watch um, uh, Max's video. Um, but this, you know, we've seen plots like this before. You, you want, obviously you want your RMSC to be as low as possible. This is ranked on RMSC. This model looks to be doing pretty good. It looks to be better than the rest, although it's, it's within the variation. Um, and this is looking even closer. Um, like at the actual um, 
parameters for each. Um, yes, there you go. Yeah. It <laughs> took them um, with three three things going on in parallel. It took you know, one and a half hours. And then we come through to this bit around basically how would you screen screen the models and then if if you haven't got the time to run all the you you don't or you you want to speed up the process you don't want to run every single parameter set like look, you're looking on every single model and we we've talked about racing before basically um getting uh it, like giving up on a model early if it if you're if it looks clear that it's not going to be the best as in if it's if it's performing worse than the others and it's you're confident that it's not um not going to be the winner you you drop it so as soon as it looks like that you stop doing that and then you keep the ones that have a chance of being the best model which um makes sense intuitively or um this bit it makes sense to me so that so that's use, using the race bit again the actual the actual code of how it happens is slightly um i think i need you need to get my head more into um and then, so using using this racing method, so the, the, basically that point around, they, they they sped up the process by over four times, um, because instead of having to run all twenty five thousand models, loads of mod, loads of um, different model types were given up on early, so that only four thousand um, two hundred forty models were given were given in the end. Um, what racing were they using? Petun and Nova, or what racing? Yeah. Did they use? Good question. Yeah. So, um, in workflow map here, tune racing over. Okay. Um, so and then this plot is showing racing against not racing, um, and the same the same results come out. And there's bas basically the the point that the the evaluation metrics they were using are highly correlated from the racing and non um, racing parameters. Um, so I think, I think they're basically saying if you, if if you push for time, use use racing, um, or push for money. I guess if you're running it, <laughs> running it in some way. Um, and so so that's that's that. And then the final part of the chapter is finalizing a model. So after you've done all the exploratory, tried out lots and lots of different model types, pick the one that looks to be the best, um, and actually so. So pull it out based off based off the metric, and then run it on the whole, the whole model, the whole, sorry, the whole data set, and actually look at how it looks. And yeah, it, it looks like a good model to me against all the observed um, data. Fits it pretty well. Um, so that was that was kind of all I have. So that I've just been um, scrolling through code, or kind of scrolling through the actual actual chapter itself, um, as opposed to running code. Uh, I think it's kind of intuitively this makes sense to me, as in this this kind of idea. Um, it's quite cool. I I don't know if in I don't know that I have ever, have ever had the need to try something like this, but I can see that it happening if you're given a a large data or a kind of a large problem around. We want to estimate this, and you're not really sure where to start. Um, kind of throwing a lot of different models at it and seeing how they work is quite a cool approach, and that's that's what. That's what this chapter is all about: throwing lots of models at the same problem, and then picking the best one out of that and honing in on it later. Um, and that's me. Um, does anyone have any questions or thoughts on any of that? What do people think about the idea of like, should you? should you teach this earlier like is this effectively like exploratory data analysis this is like exploring the exploring your data in the in the same way right it's like exploring the model i don't think this should be taught earlier it, it, the problem with this is that if you haven't taught people about overfitting beforehand they'll end up using a model that just fits really really well but if you actually look at the data sometimes when you do modeling it might get a good rmse but actually it might not be a very good predictor in the future mm -hmm. so you've got to be careful between accuracy and actual predictive uh, predictive ability sometimes um so what i'm trying to say there 
sometimes when you get your accuracy of score back and it will tell you that you predicted better in the future and the likelihood is it probably will do but there are elements of models that bring out different aspects of uh, patterns in the future so for instance in time series um, some models will be better at picking up trend whilst others are better at picking up the uh, season seasonality which is why then you do some things like ensembling so that you can get the different patterns from each one and then add them all together. But with many models approach, you can do a lot of modeling and you might get a better RMSE for a particular aspect of your model when you're comparing one to the other, but you might not necessarily see without plotting or investigating different, um, different models and understanding things like overfitting as to whether that is due to how you've tuned it whether that is due to, um, sorry, I'm a bit tired. Um, you might not understand quite exactly how that's really affecting the actual predictive capacity of your model, is what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah. Uh, so, it, but plus also, it helps to understand how models work before you get to this point. So like, if you don't understand resampling as well, when you come to, you know, which helps you to understand, well, how are you actually dealing with overfitting? evaluating process then you could end up with bypassing resampling so i presume that's why that's, that's been added later on mm. um there is one other thing uh, last week you guys were talking about i believe you went over simulated annealing which uh I think it's quite an interesting uh interesting training method um what i'm surprised by is that that's not really uh discussed here in relation to the tuning parameters because i think it's is it quite expensive simulated annealing in terms of, or is it faster in terms of time? But it's not necessarily the default for the tuning parameters. I think it's slower. It is slow. Pretty sure it's slower. Because I use simulated annealing for, uh, for my models, but um, which, are, which are neural nets, but we use that for almost every single model. So I wasn't sure if this was faster, which is why it was thrown at the end of the model, or whether it's slower, because it might be slower entirely in models. I don't know. So it is slower. Uh, at least from what the runs that they were doing, it appeared slower than the Bayesian. Right. I mean, it would probably depend on, uh, depend on the particular use case. I mean, you could always just set up two virtually identical search, uh, like written, do a race of your own, like mm. set it up with a virtually identical like sample and hyperparameter tuning grid, and then see which gets to the best values the quickest. So if you were doing those models again, you could change the tuning parameters to all do simulated annealing instead of doing um... Uh, say the Bayes approach if you wanted to. Yeah, just change it out, see which works better. Okay. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, anyway, getting back to this chapter. Um, it's, it's an interesting point. I'd not, I'd not considered um, ensemble models at all. Uh, so I see that's a that's a late that's a later chapter as well but of course that this this chapter is all about picking the one model when you're trying a lot of them pick the one that looks to be working the best and then use that which obviously that's a different approach to ensemble modeling where you use many models um, in a way it's a fallacy uh, because um the best uh, best approaches tend to be ensemble models um that's purely because uh, like a, well i don't know about in other areas but most car Kaggle competitions are won with ensemble modeling. Uh, the, one of the reasons for this is because you can use trees to, like, for instance, boost um, predictions. You, you can use boosted trees, bag trees, whatever you want to do. Um, you know, XG boosts and, you know, GB, uh, what's it called? E something light or whatever. Um, but the problem with the trees is that trees can't really, um, without um, additional work, kind of like predict beyond um, the values that they've seen. So they, they, only, they work on values that they've seen, not the values that they haven't seen. So there are ways around that, but 
um, the best way to just get around it is just ensemble. So you could put trees with like say a linear model and the linear model will pick out the, say the trend and the trees will be much better at picking out the changing in the, the changing cyclic activity. Um, which is also why it's not mentioned here because whilst this is telling us how to do modeling it's not telling us how modeling works as a process sorry I, the individual model work themselves so which is a different book altogether um but this is really cool um what i didn't really 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 realize was that you had to separate um out the different models into two different lists depending on what the specifications were that were going into it um but that's all really cool to be honest it's pretty straightforward doing that and also if you've like um i suppose if you've um specified them in the right way like the names what you could do is you could probably just grab them grab anything with a particular kind of model specification name from the environment and just plug that into the list if you want to avoid um naming each individual mo model yeah i think you're right You know when it's saying three workers, is it that just see it's uh, three cores? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> That's pretty quick. For 20, 25,000 models. Yeah, I mean, it probably, I mean, if you look at the ones they're using, different models that they're using. The screen isn't up anymore, but the different models that they're using are fairly rapidly building models. Mm. Oh yeah, I suppose they are, aren't they? They're not using anything particularly intensive. Because I mean, support vectors kind of linear based. There's another linear based one, nearest neighbors, mm, bad cubist rules. There's no, um, no neural nets in there. Yeah, decision trees that tend to take a little longer. Mm. Boosted tree. But yeah, no, I can see what you mean. So actually, maybe it's not so great. Hard to say. I like this workflow map. I think that's really cool. Um. Yeah, I mean, what you're talking about, about ensembling using expertise around models to know what will be able to pick out trend better in a data set versus what will be able to pick out uh, just prediction, like more accurate predictions. Um, they, they're, they're only using like that classification data set. So those types of... Um, those types of questions aren't really applicable to the data set that they're using. They're just using the like, what is it like breast cancer classification one. Mm -hmm. And so it's like purely an accuracy or no, it's different for this. It's like, that's what they use first, but it's not a time series. If I remember correctly, they're not using a time series. Yeah, they're using a, it's mostly like, uh, what's it, rock in order to work out the um work out the classification accuracy um i did watch the video with them the in for the other group where they um i actually asked a question about whether they uh, intend to expand the time series and they they essentially said they didn't have the expertise to do it so they're just allowing the kind of like model time kind of uh, and like rob hyman to kind of like uh, build that area out which i suppose is why it's not a focus on the book because they do actually do a lot more kind of classification kind of stuff or have done in their jobs in the past, particularly with like Julie being more specialized on like say, um, uh, was it uh, topic modeling and like uh, text analysis. And so that's a lot more classification kind of based, isn't it? Um, and I'm not sure about Max, he's got quite a varied things, more kind of science. So that's more uh, inferential, I suppose, isn't it? Again, I suppose that kind of comes down to classification in a way. Um, but 
I mean, it's still like an incredible framework and this looks pretty, uh, I mean, it makes it look really easy. This, this is the fun part really, isn't it? You know, the part where you try every possible tune of every, every configuration of a, um, of a different model or al sorry, algorithm and use that in order to predict in the future and see where you, you've got your very best model. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think it's, it's, it's funny, isn't it, how basically all, and all the advances in in this area is like we have more we have more computing power. <laughs> let's let's throw more things at it. Let's you know go deeper. Try every model. I I really like that. Just that approach. Um, I, I think the problem is when you come down to um, when you start looking at like say more complex uh, other data kind of sources you end up needing to model for say for instance like if you were selling if your company sells something lots of item skews so they might have a lot of variation in how the different models will um, how the different um items sell over time or um you know whatever whatever other kind of parameter you're looking at you'll have lots of different models to build so when you're iterating through loads and loads of models in order to kind of like predict on one particular set of data out of thousands of sets that you need to pick out an hour and a half is quite a lot of time um so they, so i suppose what he's saying is oh well, it can help narrow you down to which ones are the most likely to be best so, but you'll have to pick out data which have got similar pattern what you'd have to do is sample your data to pick out ones with similar patterns to find out which data sets uh what particular models would work on if you understand what i mean yeah i mean that's that's what the workflow sets is for is like if you kind of don't have a good idea of what what the data is really going to be predicted by then you just try a lot of different combinations and pick out you know the preprocessor and the model that will work the best. Um, I want to get to uh, Janita's question that she posted in the Slack about whether we want to see about creating or a like tutorial slash like walking through how to add a custom preprocessor to the tidy models framework, like a parsnip specification. Um, and if we want to do that as part of a subsequent week. I think that would be good to go over <clears throat> just because at the end of all of this is you may have learned how to use the system, you know, in the fundamental way of understanding it. But actually to think about how to create your own is probably... Uh, one of the most important things you do because there are so many algorithms you're going to eventually have to do it at some point um, unless of course you're swapping over to um, you know to python <laughs> just like just taking you out one of those libraries so through reticulate which is also an important skill but it's not really the element of this book really is it so probably quite good just to attack that one on at the end wouldn't it um, I'm, I'm just thinking like it's actually one of the things that key skills I think I'd like to learn. So I, I, I'm quite up for it, uh, up to you. Yeah, sounds like a good idea. Janita? Um, I also think it's a good idea. Sorry, I'm, I'm a bit sleepy this morning, but yes. No worries, it's Monday. We get it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it'd be interesting to see too how to like create a parsnip specification for a preprocessor. Also, honestly, for a model, because right now, I guess, I don't know how many models they have integrated into tidy models, but I even like Carrot after three, four years of development still was missing certain kinds of uh, model build specifications and so it'd be good like especially as new algorithms get released to know how to create a model specification or a 
preprocessor specification to be able to use it with tidy models. And I, I don't imagine it's that hard to do. So I think that's something we could do here. <clears throat> yeah, it looks pretty good. Um, one thing, uh, is this, I was just going through the chapters, is just looking through 16 to 21. And I don't know if it's my screen because I've got too many tabs open, uh, but does anyone else see any data on these chapters? No, they're, they're empty. They're just placeholders, I think. Right. <laughs> so we're at the end of the book then. So. We've, we've reached it, yeah, which is why, what, hence this conversation, I think. Yeah, yeah, I, so I was thinking, oh, well, there's these other chapters to go, so we'll put that in uh, another five weeks' time or something. So actually, this would be next week then, wouldn't it? Yeah, the, I made the same mistake. Um, I thought we still had like four or five chapters to go, but they haven't written them yet. So uh, Kevin suggested that we... Um, use like personal whatever data sets and like professional and personal projects that we're working on uh, and want to apply tidy models to people bring their project questions to the group and we kind of like work through it and come up with some real life applications of this stuff because a lot of the uh examples are a little bit contrived they use very mm -hmm. small data sets and very uh, kind of simplistic, very clean data. <laughs> and a lot of the real life applications of this is a lot more messy. And so working through all the kinds of challenges that come along with that together. Um, and Janita brought this using creating a, a PARA FAC uh, preprocessor would be a place to start. And we could possibly do like some time series stuff, although we've, we've done quite a bit in some examples of time series until they create those chapters. So we just kind of work on those kind of case examples until they finish those chapters and then we can pick it back up. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, as you're saying, there's loads of, um, <clears throat> loads of um, algorithms that haven't been implemented in, um, in Carrot. Um, and that's why they end up like um, using Torch or like linking in with through Python into R, which is, uh, <laughs> I mean, Python as an IDE is actually amazing compared to what's available in other, other areas. So like uh, VS is a bit crap, to be honest, by comparison. Still good, still great. It's just not as good. Um, so, I mean, I've got a particular example that I need to do for work, which is... They use, um, uh, my company uses uh, perhaps a, what I would consider to be a more simple neural net design. Well, it's complex, but they, they, they use neural net design. But the thing is, it's not implemented in tidy models. They have a neural net uh, through uh, NNetter or NNet, whatever. And I've always thought it'd be quite nice to build like um, just something sim really simple like a Elman or a, a Jordan uh, um, uh, algorithm, which isn't actually currently implemented. So you've got like, um, you know, oh, I was just thinking about like how it can, you know, it holds the memory, goes through feedback. And then you can also put, implement it through, for instance, different kind of like simulated kneeling or back propagation or something like that, which would be quite cool. Um, but um, I've no, I've no, I haven't quite got around to it, but I think this is probably a good, uh, good opportunity to basically just pull an algorithm into tidy models. And maybe we've all got like an example of where there's an algorithm that's in a package that isn't actually entirely models yet. Is, well, I mean, that might be something that's in scope for this group. Is the, <clears throat> the neural net that they're running though, is it, can it be ported to from R yet? Like, is that built yet? Like, is it a uh, back end for like in net package uh, or is it something that's like built in C entirely and it's not yet ported to R through like RCPP. Oh no, it's, it's different. Like I couldn't use what my company is using, but um, what I can, but what I have found is a package uh, called, I think it's RNN or something like that. Um, and they do have a Jordan or a, 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 you know, basic neural nets already implemented in them. And then I was just thinking, well, if that, that package exists, but it's not actually entirely models yet. So why, why not uh, just basically see if I can like link that up uh, into tidy models and see if we can get that to work. 
Um, but I, I was just thinking like, well, that's a particular example for me, but I'm pretty sure that everyone else has got some example where they have a modeling problem. Well, not necessarily a modeling problem, but even if they just want to put a particular model in that doesn't exist, which is I think what uh, Danita was saying as well. Yeah, I'd be down to do that, honestly, because once I upgrade my computer, I'm hoping to add a long, short-term neural net model mm. uh, to the existing workflow that I'm using that I demonstrated. And I'd like to know how to do that with tidy models so it fits in the existing code that I have. So I'd be interested in doing that too. So maybe uh, I will drop a question into our cohort channel for the rest of the members about next week starting on creating a Parsnip preprocessor specification for this uh, P-A-R-A-F-A-C, Parafac, I guess, Parafac. I don't know, how to, that, that's how it sounds like it should be pronounced. <laughs> And um, Janita, would you be willing to give us whatever like back reading materials and whatnot that we need to know how to get going? Not like the parsnip stuff, we can look at that, but whatever we need to know about that particular, uh, that particular pre-processing technique. Um, I, I can do that, yes, because I've got everything, you know, already ready or handy. So, uh, yes. Okay. Okay, cool. Then I'll ask in the group. And I, uh, yeah, I'll just send a message out in the group and make sure everybody's on board for that. And if they are, then I'll just ping you in Slack and ask you to post that stuff so people can be up to speed by the time we take a look at it next week. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Luke. Yeah, see you next week. All right, bye. 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 See you next week.